we're going to take a closer look at how carbohydrates are digested and absorbed. So let's make a note, carbohydrates. So this entire section, all we're going to look at is, all we're going to focus on is carbohydrates. And what I'm going to tell you, let's, let's orient ourselves to the drawing that I'm about to do for you. This is the lumen. I'm going to have a cell here, and this is going to be the extracellular fluid. And what I'm going to tell you is that my cell, I'm going to kind of make it a skinny cell, and you will see that actually, hmm, so many issues. I'm going to make it a super skinny cell. Is the cell lining the lumen of the digestive system actually skinny? Holy no. Here's my nucleus. It is not skinny and flat. In fact, if I were to draw an actual cell, I'm going to run out of room, so I'm going to put it over here just so you guys can see it. The cells lining the, um, in the epithelial tissue of the digestive system look just like this. They're super tall. They have microvilli. What is the function of a microvillus? They're little cytoplasmic extensions that look like hairs, but they actually have cytoplasm in there. The function is to increase the surface area. Jillions and jillions of microvilli in the uh, intestine. It's not the end of the story. It's not the only way that the surface area of the digestive system is increased. In fact, you have villi as well. And villi are full-blown um, folds in the actual lining of the, the digestive tract. And these villi are composed, look, I'm drawing epithelial cells. We'll go like this. Yeah, sure, you get the idea. Those are all epithelial cells. And what is on the luminal edge of all of those epithelia? Yeah, they're microvilli. So this whole thing is a villus. These little guys are the microvilli. Why do we have all that? To increase the surface area, particularly in the small intestine, because this is where we're absorbing the majority of the nutrients out of the system. So the more surface area we have, the more cell membrane we have for transporters who can do the absorption for us. That's the primary thing we're going to look at here. We're going to look at carbohydrates. You know that carbohydrates are basically long strings of sugars. And in fact, I could draw you one here. This is a complex carbohydrate. And really, all it is is a string of simple sugars linked together. Maybe this is starch. What did I tell you? What is the enzyme that digests starch? Do you remember? It was amylase. Just a minute, I'm going to change my color. We're going to make our enzymes red. Amylase is the enzyme. This is an example of how I can take a complex carbohydrate and break it up. Where is this taking place? It's taking place in the lumen of the, the digestive tract. It's taking place in the lumen of the small intestine. Amylase breaks the starch up into not complex carbohydrates. It breaks it into um, much simpler molecules called disaccharides. Why do you think they're called disaccharides? I can hear you. Good job. It's because they have two di, they have two simple sugars that make them up. Now, I am going to hold you accountable for knowing the names of these simple sugars, I mean these disaccharides, because there are three primary disaccharides that we're going to look at. Number one, I'm starting on this end because this is the one I remember first, lactose. Lactose, milk sugar, is a disaccharide. And it's totally relevant that you know 
that lactose can be broken up into, like it can be not disaccharides anymore. It can be broken into monosaccharides. Does anybody know what two monosaccharides make up the disaccharide of lactose? One glucose and one galactose. And does anybody guess what the name of the enzyme is that breaks lactose into those two products? Lactase. Oh, show. The next one, ah, sucrose. Sucrose is table sugar. You never eat that. I know. I don't eat it either. Sucrose is broken into glucose and fructose. I'm going to have to get a new picture here. Glucose and fructose, um, when they're combined, they make sucrose. And my last one, <clears throat> I have to tell you that it is particularly stressful when I'm on the spot like this. I don't want to look. Okay, push, well, it doesn't even matter. I should be the one pushing pause while I think of it. Sucrose, lactose, I want to say galactose, but no. I'm really going to have to look it up. I will never forget it again. Maltose, who eats maltose? Malto meal. Maltose is actually, this is an easy one. Who breaks up maltose? That would be maltase. Who breaks up sucrose? That would be sucrase. And maltose gets broken into what? You know it's true. This is the easiest one of all of them. There's no excuse for not remembering it. Two glucose molecules make up a maltase. Okay, I mean a maltose, which is broken up by maltase into two glucose molecules. What do we have? We have simple sugars. This comes in handy because you can't absorb starch. You can't absorb disaccharides. You actually have to absorb these guys, which are also known as monosaccharides. That says monosaccharides heading off the wall. Are you ready to see how we absorb those into the extra, uh, extracellular fluid? allow me to demonstrate. First of all, guess who you are going to find embedded in this wall. I know you recognize that guy. It's Sigalt. For real? Yeah, for real. And the food that you eat has sodium in it. And guess what? The food you eat has more sodium in it than the cell itself. And therefore, and if Sigel is going to work, what has to be true about the cell itself? We cannot have sodium inside the cell, right? How do we get sodium out of the cell? Who does that? Who does that? That is our friend, I'm sorry, ooh, good Lord, no. We're not going brown. Come on, orange is the hardest one for me to get. Why do I make it orange? It's the sodium-potassium pump. Sodium-potassium pump is so important. The sodium-potassium pump pumps the sodium out, pumps the potassium in. Interestingly, you probably should ask what happens to the potassium when it gets pumped in, and in all actuality, usually there is a potassium channel that just kind of stays open and allows the potassium to leak back out. You aren't using the sodium-potassium pump in this case to create an action potential. You're using the sodium-potassium pump to get rid of the sodium so Sigalt can bring in what? 
sodium down its concentration gradient. And who else is coming along for the ride? Glucose. Glucose made it into the cell. Thank you, sodium potassium pump, because it would not happen if it didn't have the sodium potassium pump getting rid of the sodium from inside the cell. Can you visualize how they're working together here? Okay, glucose is now in the cell. Who are you going to use to get glucose out of the cell? What I'll tell you right now is that because of the sodium potassium pump, Sigolt's going to keep on working. Sigolt is going to keep on pulling glucose in because there is going to be a concentration gradient for sodium. Sodium's going to want to come in. Sigolt's going to work and bring in glucose. No matter how much glucose is out there, it's going to keep coming in. That means that we have a concentration gradient and glucose can travel down its concentration gradient through, yes, what is that? My friend, the glut. Glut will allow the glucose to just d d <laughs> diffuse down its concentration gradient and into the extracellular fluid. Now, somebody, somewhere, I, I mean, that's really not that bad, all things considered. Somebody somewhere should probably be asking, what do they have? What does the cell have that would actually make the glucose maybe not make it into the extracellular fluid? What I draw? Mitochondria. Why doesn't the glucose enter the mitochondria and just get yumptialized by this cell that clearly needs a lot of energy anyway to produce this, um, to fuel the sodium potassium pump. This is so incredible. These cells that line the digestive tube, they do not eat glucose. They don't eat glucose. Everybody eats glucose. They don't. For what, uh, what is the chemical mechanism of that? They cannot metabolize glucose during cellular respiration. Instead, they have to use, I want to say glutamine, but I actually can't, I've got glutamine written down. It's an amino acid. They use an amino acid to get their energy instead of using glucose. If they used glucose, they probably would just get really fat and be like, dude, why do any work ever? Instead, they have to absorb glutamine and the glucose they can just send out to the blood and transport it to other cells. Your body is unbelievable. This is how carbohydrates are digested and absorbed into your extracellular fluid. We're going to do the same thing for proteins next. It'll be fun.